The next tab we need to look at is the fuel tab. We need to decide what tuning method we're going to use. Haltech has a bunch here, which is volumetric efficiency, mass airflow, and injection time. Now, most ECUs from around the uh, late 90s, early 2000s would have been an injection time ECU, where you literally just write in an injection pulse to your fuel map and the injector squirts for that long. It's a very crude way of doing things. It doesn't really take into account changes and you end up having lots of trim tables and correction tables to try and account for air temperature changes, coolant temperature changes, throttle position changes, and so on. Really, unless you're doing independent throttle bodies, there's no reason to still use this method. If you're using either factory or aftermarket mass airflow sensors, you can reuse these. It's a very good way of tuning, um, but be aware that any changes you make to the intake will throw your math calibration off and will require to be recalibrated. Volumetric efficiency is probably the most popular and the most common way for an aftermarket ECU to be tuned for fuel. It takes account of the engine displacement, the air temperature, the pressure of the air in the manifold and then uses an efficiency number to work out how much of that air actually made it into the cylinder. This is a pretty good method as it does account for boost and natural spray engines equally as well. It accounts for your air warming up and cooling down. When tuned well it's probably the best method and the easiest to understand for most people. Um, mass airflow sensors can be a bit of a pain to set up, although good once they're going. Injection time is great, start just putting numbers into a map and making things happen but if you decide to change your injector sizes or you decide that you want to change your car the whole thing goes all over the place and it's just wrong so while it's quick to get started it's crude to correct crude in, in general really I pretty much avoid it if possible so we're going to go for volumetric efficiency on this engine even though the RB26 used to have MAF sensors they won't be good enough for the sort of power we're looking at so we're going to get rid of them and just run volumetric efficiency now I'm not sure why you'd want to run VE without air temp correction there may be a reason why Halter gives you this option but the whole point of volumetric efficiency is, is that it uses the air pressure, the air temperature and the volume of the air and the ideal gas law to basically come up with the mass of air in the engine. If you don't account for temperature then you're not accounting for the uh, total mass of air so I would always, unless you've got a reason not to, use also air temp compensation which also means you don't need this manual table over here for air temp correction. You can leave it on but set the entire table to zero and only use it if you find any odd situations where you do need to make a correction. So the next thing is where we're going to get our fuel load source. So you, for your VE table you'll need to have an engine speed and a way of determining engine and load. For volumetric efficiency this most normally is what's known as the MAP sensor, so the manifold absolute pressure sensor. You could possibly use a TPS for non-boosted applications but generally people using TPS's are just using a pulse width mapping. Uh, air mass per cylinder is more focused on, a, on something with a mass airflow sensor. Uh, I've never really used the engine pressure ratio, so I couldn't tell you more about that. But what we're going to use is a MAP sensor. Next is your fuel pressure input. So this is more down to do with calculating the mass of fuel to go with the mass of air. If your fuel pressure regulator just has a static pressure, meaning as your manifold pressure changes the ratio between the pressure behind the, fu behind the, behind the fuel injector and the pressure of the manifold changes then the ECU needs to know this is changing. Most cars you'll use a vacuum line from your manifold to your fuel pressure regulator to maintain your injector um, ratio basis so you keep the same amount of extra pressure behind the injectors as is in front of the injectors which then keeps the injector size constant in this case the base fuel pressure will be typically 3 bar. Uh, when you're setting up your engine for time and light don't forget about the disable injector option. Now if you wish to have more than one injector per uh, cylinder so you want to have I don't know, a set of 1000 cc injectors and then a second set of 1000 cc injectors because you're looking to make 2000 horsepower but you don't want to run all, all 12 injectors at once you can do what's known as injector staging and at which point you can say there's actually two stages and then you can say how you wish to run your additional stage of injectors so what will happen is 
the ECU will come along and say, right, I'm going to run on these injectors normally. As soon as I hit a certain criteria or a certain fuel request, I'm then going to enable my second set of injectors. This is for people who don't want to run, say, 2000 CZ injectors because they want a bit of better aisle control, they want a bit of, little better nice response on the street for a slightly smaller injector. Um, but given how good some injectors are these days, you have to be on a pretty massive power to want to use stage injection. So we won't be using stage injection, we'll only have a single stage of injection. And we'll use something like an ID 1000 or an ID something 2000 maybe for this setup. As before, we've got six cylinders, we're going for sequential injection, which means we've got one injector per cylinder. Other options are you could have uh, si three injectors and share them, or you could have six injectors but do it semi-sequential, so you squirt, say, one and six, uh, two and five, and three and four, but do it every, every engine cycle and put half the fuel amount in every time. So, again, if you lose your um, home signal, you can still run semi-sequential, but for sequential, you need a home signal to know exactly what engine rotation you're on, i.e. whether it's number one's getting the fuel or number six is getting the fuel on this rotation. Other options are batch fire where you fire all the injectors or multi-point where you might have uh, two or three injectors in the manifold which aren't necessarily pointing at one specific cylinder but you can then fire them for a bunch of cylinders. The pretty much best way of doing things is sequential or semi-sequential and install your injectors per cylinder. So in addition to the base setup, there's also a bunch of fuel tables here we can add to the ECU. By default, there's a few selected, and depending what tuning method you use, you may want to select or remove some of these tables. The overall correction allows you to quickly change the entire fuel map by a certain percentage, which will affect everything. Prime pulse, cranking fuel amounts are very useful for starting your car. The base fuel map will not be able to start your car cold. You need to be able to have extra enrichment to help the car start when cold, so these are required. The zero demand fuel is not really required for VE because we still look at the manifold pressure when the throttles close. Coolant temp correction can be useful to help get the car going once the car started and keeping it running where the wall film is still building in the manifold and the fuel is not yet evaporating very well. So this table is quite useful. Air temp correction is not needed because we're using the auto VE compensation. Same as map correction is not really needed, nor is biometric compensation. These would normally be used if you were doing a pulse width mapping. Post start correction, again, like the coolant temp correction, can help get your engine going just after starting to help build the wall film and keep the thing running rather than immediately stalling or leading out from starting. Cylinder correction is a useful thing, so if you have the ability to monitor air fuel ratios on different bank cylinders, individual cylinders, or using EGTs, you can actually then add or remove fuel to individual cylinders. Gear correction shouldn't really be needed, but there's also a bunch of generic corrections you can set up your own custom maps for using various sensors. I sometimes use various sensors like a fuel pressure sensor and set up a custom map so that if the fuel pressure starts dropping, I can have the ECU automatically compensate and actually add the fuel back in, which is a very good way of saving the engine before it leans out. And then the fuel compensation correction is to do with flex fuel, which we're not going to cover just yet. Uh, same with these lambda tables, they're more down to a generic connection or a fuel compensation correction, which we don't need yet. So next we come out of our main setup and we'll just set up some basic values here, for example, in the air temp correction. Because we're using auto air temp correction, we actually want to zero this table out, so we'll just type zero. Um, and the next thing is to come down to the bottom here where we can find our injection system. Uh, if you have more than one stage, we'll see more than one sub-option here, but we're using a single stage of injection. So there's four maps here that are important. Uh, first of all, we'll start off with the current settings. This is to do with what style of injector you're using. If you're using a high impedance or a low impedance injector, it's important you select the right value here. If you try and drive a low impedance injector with, as a high impedance, you could burn it out and damage it. So make sure you're choosing the rough resistance value which is correct for your injector. If it's 10, 12, 14 ohms then it's considered a high. If it's low impedance it'll be one of these two options. Alternatively you can do a custom if you know what current you wish to limit the injector to. Next is flow rate. You need to get this as close as possible to your exact flow rate. However if you are off by a few cc it's not the end of the world. It will artificially scale your VE numbers up and down a bit. 
but ideally get your injectors flow tested, get them matched and then fill in the most accurate CC you can. If your injectors are not perfectly matched you can then use the per cylinder fuel tables to add a couple of percent, remove a couple of percent to balance the injector sizes. Next, injector dead times. This is critical, especially when you go for large injectors. A lot of people don't see the importance of de uh, dead time, but I've seen so many people have cars where they they map idle, it's sitting there lovely, and then the car warms up, and then for whatever reason, the air fuel ratio is miles off. And it's because on big injectors, a small error in your dead time can have a big change in your overall f fuel pulse. This time is the amount of time it takes the injector to open before fuel will start to flow. So you need to have this correct. And it also changes based on the fuel pressure you run and the battery voltage at the time. So ensure you've got the most accurate data you can for this. What I like to do is also edit the table axis and also include the pressure as well as the battery voltage and I'll fill in 2 bar, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4 bar. So that if the fuel pressure raises or drops again it's compensating just as if you were to lose your alternator and your battery voltage starts to drop it would compensate for longer dead times. When you're running with small injectors if this is off by a little bit you don't notice you'll find that your fuel's a couple percent off here and there but as your injector gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you require smaller and smaller pulses for idle and cruising if this is not right you will have headaches after headaches trying to get your map right. You'll get your VE right at one time the conditions will change and your VE will be wrong. So make sure you get your dead times correct. Don't rely on the internet. I've seen so many people go, oh, I've got 1,000 cc such and such injectors and go off Googling and find any old dead times they can. They will not be your injectors necessarily. The information may not be accurate and you're just going to cause yourself headache after headache. If you're unsure on them and you can't get an accurate data sheet for your injectors from your injector supplier, get them flow tested. Your flow tester should be able to calculate your injector type dead times for you and make sure you get these accurate as possible. The last one which is kind of important if you understand how it works is your firing angle. Now these firing angles will be okay for most people with pretty medium sized cams. However if you have a high overlap cam or you have a long duration cam you may find especially with big injectors that these values are not correct and it means you end up squirting fuel when both your exhaust and intake valves are open which means the fuel you think you're putting in the, in the cylinder some of it goes out the exhaust. Your wideband O2 sensor will always read lean but your exhaust gas will always smell rich, you'll see liquid fuel coming out the exhaust and you'll be wondering why you just can't get it to idle right. There are various tools or your cam suppliers will should be able to give you information about what angles your cams are fully shut at on the exhaust side so you can calculate your exact injection angles properly. Like I said, these values are pretty much okay for most people, but I would highly suggest looking at your cam profiles and calculating the correct injector firing angles for your application to get the best idle, the best even economy, you know, emissions, and just, just making the car run well at low, low fuel pulses.